How will we power our future? Can we create a healthy and clean economy? Climate One at the Commonwealth Club is at the forefront of the global debate about energy, economy, and the environment. Bringing together the brightest and most provocative leaders of our time, Climate One is the place where big ideas get heard. With thoughtful and insightful discussions on policy, business, science, and culture, Climate One founder Greg Dalton gets to the heart of the matter. It's our future. It's time to come together. The epic blazes in the American West are taking damage to property, people, and ecosystems to a new level. On the show today, we will discuss causes and costs of wildfires in the West. Our guests are Rich Gordon, president of the California Forestry Association, which represents the timber industry. He previously represented San Mateo in the State Assembly. Lizzie Johnson is a staff writer for the San Francisco Chronicle, where covering wildfires is now a full-time and year-round beat. Scott Stevens is a professor of fire science at UC Berkeley. He's an expert on wildfires and has written about managing fire and forests in a changing climate. Later in the show, we'll discuss two urgent needs in California, decarbonizing the economy and creating more affordable housing, preferably near transit. Climate One starts now. Lizzie Johnson, let's hear about Ed Bledsoe, a 76-year-old man. Tell us his story. Yeah, so Ed Bledsoe lives up near Reading with his wife and their two great-grandchildren. And during the car fire, it swept in really suddenly. He had just gone down the street to pick up a check from his doctor. And, you know, while he was gone for those 15 minutes, his wife and those two little kids, they were four and five years old, they both burned in their home. And it shocked a lot of people just because... It came out of nowhere, and they were two little kids, and they were some of the first victims of that fire tornado. And Scott Stevens, one reason that Ed Bledsoe didn't take those little kids with him that day was 113 degrees. So tell us how the high temperatures and the low humidity is kind of amplifying these fires we've seen recently in the West. Yeah, we have temperature like that, and humidity, what it does, it just sucks out moisture out of fuel. So dead fuels certainly going to get drier, and we know that's happening already just because of climate change and warming. And even the green fuels can have impacts from drought. So if you actually make fuel drier, you're just going to be able to burn it easier and have higher intensity, more flame lengths. So uh, climate is making it drier, hotter, uh, more, uh, you know, amplifying these fires. You know, set the stage for us, Scott Stevens, in terms of uh, the records that we're seeing. Are there really more fires or is it just our perception? Is it just because they're hitting urban areas? Because nationally, Mm -hmm. there's actually fewer acres burned this year Mm -hmm. than last year. No, I hear this a lot, like, you know, fire areas up and things of that nature. I think fire area in California is somewhat... Variable, certainly. I don't think it's a big increase in trend. Maybe starting to see a trend on that. But as you said, we're seeing fires impact people. So when fires impact people and communities and kill people, as we just heard, we're talking about major impacts. So that, I think, elevates the whole discussion that happens around fire. And there's no doubt fire season is getting longer because of climate change, more variation, precipitation. We can have fires on the ground longer. That's absolutely true but it's really impacting people's lives more. And I think that's what happens with the conversation. And so why are fires coming to people now more more than in the past? I mean, what is it about the last couple of years that suddenly, I've been covering climate for 10 years and kind of knew about fire, but it's really become kind of a headline issue the last couple of years. I think there's a couple of things. One is just bad luck. You know, we're getting fires in places where we're just having them run at communities, 100,000 people, 50,000, unfortunately, and then they're hitting communities. The other part still is we're building in areas that are just more vulnerable. A great example, Napa Valley had a fire in 81 that actually burned maybe 50, 60 houses. The same perimeter, 2017, burned 600 in that realm, you know? So you're seeing so many more people living in places that are beautiful, but they're fire places. So we're seeing them really have vulnerabilities and fires hitting them. Rich Gordon, uh, some people think that the timber industry is using these fires to kind of as, as a, exploiting this opportunity to, to get uh, relaxed restrictions to get more logging. Is that happening? No, it isn't happening. <laughs> um, the, uh, we actually uh, are producing uh, far less timber in California than we ever had. We have fewer sawmills, We've had an 80% reduction in a 20-year period in the, in the timber production in the sawmills in California. Um, what we're concerned about as an industry uh, is our neighbors. Um, our lands are fairly well managed. Um, 
that has to be done uh, because of the, uh, the way timber harvest is done in California. Uh, but uh, today, uh, when fire starts next door, it can encroach onto to our lands. So we've actually taken a, a position that really wants to look at forest health in a very broad way, concerned about all of the forests in California, not just the ones that uh, the timber companies manage. And Lizzie Johnson, you've been on the front lines talking to people. What are their experiences? People saying like, wow, this is different. We've seen fires, but this is different. What are they telling you? They're horrified. I mean, like you mentioned, the fires are coming into more developed areas like Santa Rosa. These are people that never thought that their home would burn down. And now they're getting evacuated in the middle of the night with no warning. Mm -hmm. They're terrified. They're traumatized. They think it's going to happen again. So what's the solution to then those people want to rebuild? Lizzie Johnson, are there any laws saying, well, maybe we shouldn't rebuild there because these fires tend to come back every few decades, right? Yeah, so that's where we're at right now. We're trying to figure out what comes mm -hmm. next. There's no precedent saying that you can take a landowner's right yeah. to rebuild away. Mm -hmm. So they can rebuild if they want to. And oftentimes, because they have those emotional attachments to their homes, they want to rebuild it just as it was, mm -hmm. thinking that lightning won't strike in the same place twice. Mm -hmm. But... Areas that experience fire will often experience it again. And Scott Stevens, people in Northern California and the West love to have trees next to their homes and, you know, mm -hmm. live in near mm -hmm. nature. And it's yeah. very idyllic and pastoral and, and yet it's, it's dangerous. Oh, it is. You know, I, I love trees. I'm a, kind of a tree nut, frankly. So, um, but I think you're right. I mean, you, if you live in these areas, you can still have trees near your home and, and beautiful vegetation, but you can also manage it to lower its density, less trees per acre, less fuel on the ground, you know, make your house a little bit more resistant to fire. So there's things you can do to really make a difference. So there is great hope that we could actually make things better here in the state too. Lizzie Johnson, what, you've interviewed some of these, uh, these firefighters. Tell us about, you know, first of all, the fatigue they must be going through because it's just nonstop. Yeah, morale is definitely lower this year because there have been so many firefighter fatalities. I was up in Ukiah a couple of weeks ago at the fire camp the morning after one of their firefighters died on the Mendocino complex, and it was the first fatality for that fire. And there was just this sense of shock and disbelief. Like, we're out here trying to save houses and stop this fire, and people are dying, and now we have to go do it again. It seems very real to them all of a sudden how many risks come along with that job. Risks and, and really high cost. Do you have a sense of how much is being spent on fire, firefighting in California, Lizzie? I don't have the exact number, but I imagine one of these lovely men <laughs> <laughs> do have that number. S Scott, I mean, it's bigger, bigger part of the state budget. It is. I, the last number I saw, I, I'm probably a little out of date, about $430 million has been spent by the state this year on firefighting. It doesn't include probably the federal firefighting as well. And I think we've almost actually used up the entire allocation for firefighting as of probably right now. So everything else is going to be in excess of what's been budgeted. So close to half a billion. And how does that compare to, say, 10 years ago? <laughs> yeah. You know, as back around the mid-90s, the mid-90s, when we look at the budget of firefighting through the whole nation, it was around $200 million, $150 million. That was in the whole nation, federal firefighting. And today, very typical for us to spend $2.5 billion. So it's gone from something on the order you know, of 200 million, 250 million in that range to 2.5 billion from the mid 90s. Scott Stevens, get your thoughts on controlled burns. Sure, you know, a lot of times we do these backfires trying to actually make a, a stand on a fire. As a fire comes at you, you wanna burn the fuel in front of it. And then if you do that correctly, of course the fire goes out. And prescribed fires is another tool where we can actually make a plan, prescribed fire plan and a smoke management plan is required. You get that plan reviewed, approved and then you actually have a set of conditions you can do your burning we've done around 75 of these over so in, in in california so you then are actually putting fire on the ground for a resource objective maybe fuel load maybe it's going to be wildlife habitat maybe you're just trying to do something to maybe reduce a non-native plant so it actually is then putting fire on the ground by humans for an objective and doing it deliberately based on two plans and then doing the best you can and that's the part that the governor is trying to say we well, want to increase um, and I, I'm, I'm really strongly supportive of it because it really can be a big piece of this. Rich Gordon, I'm looking at you thinking you've been an elected politician in the state assembly. Uh, what kind of public squabbling? I just can hear constituents saying, why are you burning? Why are you doing that? You're ruining my Sunday. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, I think uh, uh, the, the issue of a controlled burn uh, for forest management is something that is not well understood in California. Yeah. Um, first of all, we've not used it frequently. 
uh, in recent times, yeah. although it was uh, a tool often used uh, by the first peoples who were here. Yeah. Um, they actually uh, would set fire, uh, to knowing that would actually improve forest health by removing the underbrush and, and leaving uh, the, the taller trees. Um, so we have to explain to people why this is a, a tool uh, that can be helpful in thinning and removing the undergrowth um, in order for them to understand. We also need to point out that uh, we still follow all of the uh, air pollution guidelines in California when we do this work. And so uh, these plans are not approved unless the local air board uh, approves them uh, and approves the timing of it. So we're still following the environmental rules, but it's, it is something that's not well understood. Rich Gordon, there's something called the fire fix, I believe. It was one of the, the rare uh, bipartisan efforts that Congress did. Tell us about that. They actually came together around fire and did something, actually worked together. <laughs> yeah. So at the uh, federal level, the uh, uh, U.S. Forest Service uh, has never had a dedicated source of funding for firefighting. So what they've had to do uh, is take money out of maintenance uh, and restoration in order to pay for the fires and firefighting. Um, what Congress did uh, last spring in um, the omnibus spending bill was fix that. Uh, the fire fix means that for the first time now, uh, the U.S. Forest Service actually has a dedicated, will have in 2020, a dedicated source of funding to fight fires. The positive nature of that is that uh, they will no longer have to steal money from restoration and maintenance uh, and that's a positive in terms of improving the health and resiliency of the federal forests. And uh, Secretary of the Interior Ryan Zinke uh, was uh, speaking recently and said that really that, that uh, part of this is, is human cause, Rich Gordon, that there should be thinning of the forest would, would uh, reduce the fuel that then makes these mega fires. You probably agree with that? Well, uh, I, I don't necessarily agree with the approach uh, that the Secretary suggested. But what is important to understand is that we have too much fuel. Our forests are too dense. We have um, allowed them to overgrow because we have aggressively fought fire and done fire suppression. Smokey the bear is part of the problem. Unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And maybe Bambi too, I don't know. <laughs> um, but um, a thinner forest is a healthier forest. Um, it is better for the watersheds. Uh, it's better for carbon sequestration. So we're not talking about you know, going in and clear cutting a forest, that would actually be disastrous. What's important is to go in and thin uh, and leave the stronger, healthier trees that uh, are good for carbon sequestration and good for uh, forest resiliency. Now, uh, Scott Stevens, some environmentalists would hear that and say that's damaging, that the, you know, the thinning is actually home to ecosystems and species, mm -hmm. and that that's what uh, thinning is kind of, is damaging to forests. Well, I, I hear that too, and, and I, you know, there's no doubt when you put a machine into a forest, that's not a natural event, but I agree that so many of our forests are in conditions that are really unsustainable. You look at the mortality that happens just from drought and insects, and we put fire on top. We see mortality happening from these events that is well outside anything we want. So, but there is hope again. The hope is we could actually do these removals of the smaller to medium-sized trees, enhance the larger trees. And the also, the other thing that's so important is we call it surface fuel. Surface fuel simply is a dead and down woody material on top of the forest. Dead and down, okay. Yeah, the wood on the ground, right? And turned out, in about 70% of cases, that's going to be maybe the highest amount of energy in a wildfire. It's not the crowns. So the crowns certainly can make huge flames, and they do. But you really need to have that surface fuel to have a high amount of heat to initiate that crown fire. So one of the challenges is you can reduce tree density, too, and you also have to reduce that woody fuel on the ground because that initiates fire behavior that actually in initiates crown fire. Uh, Lizzie Johnson, tell us about the phases of disaster after these fires come in. They devastate a community. What do the people go through? Yeah, so the human impact of this, you have the disaster, and then you have all of these he heroic events where you hear about people running into houses to save the puppy and camping out in a pool overnight and surviving. And then the entire community is really cohesive. They're together. You see the Sonoma County Strong posters going up after something like the Wine Country wildfires. And then they slip into disillusionment, where it seems like everyone else is moving on, 
they're seeing their friends having holidays in their homes and going through life milestones while they're still displaced in hotels, living with friends and family. And then you get that up until the one year anniversary and then it seems like there's a little bit of a setback. You realize that a year has passed and you really have not gone that far. And then the rebuilding really starts to happen after that. The first year is the hardest part for the. But there's also effects by say there's housing shortage. So there's 3000 homes destroyed in one area north of San Francisco. Then the rents go up for everybody else. People want to rebuild, but it's hard to get a contractor and a plumber and an architect. Um, and so tell us about that part, you know, afterwards, you know, do people come back? Some do, some just like walk away. Yeah, it's really hard to rebuild a normal life when your job is disrupted. You don't have housing. You're trying to find housing. But in a place like Sonoma County, the vacancy rate is 1.5%. And to put that in context, that's about as long as it takes someone to move out of a, an apartment and into another apartment. So there's really no place for these people to go. Um, so they're trying to rebuild, but the resources aren't there. They're trying to find a place to stay while they rebuild. They're trying to do their job and pick up the kids from preschool and take them to school and you know, that's a lot to manage at one time. California's housing crisis is on the top of the agenda for Governor Gavin Newsom. How can the state create more affordable housing in a way that respects and includes people rather than displacing them? Our next guests explore how people can talk about underlying issues of race and class in a way that is authentic and constructive. Ann Chang is a transportation expert at Transform, a transit planning agency and advocacy group. She previously served as a city council member and mayor in El Cerrito. Isla Gracian is president of the East LA Community Corporation, a nonprofit that has built hundreds of affordable housing units in a working class neighborhood near downtown Los Angeles. Rachel Swan is a city hall reporter with the San Francisco Chronicle. She's also reported for the SF Weekly and East Bay Express. Scott Wiener is a California state senator representing San Francisco, Daly City, and Colma. And Chang, uh, let's begin with some fun, begin with you. Uh, we both watched the Brady Bunch growing up. Um, and what does the Brady Bunch and other you know, TV shows tell us about where we are in, in housing and, and urbanization in America? Um, well, you know, it's, it's interesting to see the context actually match my life. Um, I grew up in the suburbs and two car garage. And, um, and over the years, I've learned that marketers of TV uh, programs actually have some of the largest marketing budgets to do research about consumer preferences. And have you se as you've all probably seen, Friends to now, I would say, Sex in the City, and now all kinds of shows that are just all about the urban context. It very much matches what um, consumer preferences are from you know, millennials to boomers. And there's some sense that... Uh People move to the cities after the, great, uh, after the Great Recession. There's some sense that that's actually slowing down now, perhaps because cities are getting so expensive. Senator Wiener, how can we think about, how do you think about the two pressing issues for California? Housing, which is very tangible and immediate, and climate, which seems to be abstract and far away. Uh, yeah, they, they are, uh, they're absolutely linked. Uh, and we, we've gone through a long period of time uh, speaking of the Brady Bunch, where, uh, where we, uh, this country encu encouraged, actively encouraged people uh, to leave cities, uh, to spread out, to uh, live in the suburbs, to drive everywhere. Um, to, in my uh, suburb where I grew up, there were no sidewalks, there was uh, almost no bus service. Uh, and what, what we've done is we have uh, uh, just spiked carbon emissions as a result of our land use patterns, making sure that people are living in places where they have to drive everywhere, where they have to drive to work, they have to drive to the store, where there's no other options uh, for anyone, whether you're poor, whether you're middle class, there, there's no option to get around other than driving. Uh, and that that's a problem. And we need to get back to the way uh, we did it for a long time, which was to have people living near each other, uh, having people live near where they work, being able to walk, get around in ways where they're not uh, burning fossil fuels. And the only way you can do that is to have uh, ho denser housing, have multi-unit housing, uh, near public transportation, uh, closer to where people uh, work. Otherwise, we'll just keep spreading out 
as a matter of affordability, as a matter of just how we've structured things, uh, and we're going to make our climate situation even worse. And that all sounds good. I think a lot of people nod, say, yes, that's walkable, good, density, good, until it comes to a particular neighborhood. So, Isabel Gracian, why don't you tell us the story of, uh, of Boyle Heights, which is a very interesting story, east of downtown Los Angeles. The, the metro rail came there, and then what followed? Yeah, so Bull Heights literally is just across the bridge from downtown Los Angeles. And um, historically, it's been home to immigrant communities, being one of the few neighborhoods where people of color could live um, during redlining and exclusion um, in the city of LA. So because of that, there was also a lot of lack of investment, including um, transportation and the lack of having the light light rail going through, and when we got the light rail, there was a lot of concerns around the speculation that was happening with uh, with land, and what that would mean for a predominantly tenant community of immigrants, low income, that didn't have um, land high land ownership. And what we've been seeing in Bull Heights, because we also have a long history of activism, um, that includes being the home of the Chicano blowouts around educational justice, that we have this infrastructure around community organizing and engaging residents. So in Bull Heights, we're at this moment where we could potentially be the model of a neighborhood that doesn't completely flip with gentrification because of the, the decades of work of community residents to really drive the investment and raise this question of, we want investment, we want development, but we want to benefit the people that invested their lives when nobody else would invest their money in this neighborhood. And just, you, you passed over that very quickly. People live there because there was actually racial exclusion and covenants by people of certain races couldn't buy property in certain parts of Los Angeles. Right, races and religion, you know, the Bull Heights had a strong Jewish community, those African American, Russian, Japanese American, um, then waves from Latin America, predominantly Mexico, and, you know, throughout the different transformations, it, you know, with the Japanese community, it was a forceful removal, right, when the internment camps came, so the transformation of population hasn't been just a natural transition, some of those uh, removals have been very forceful and violent to, to the neighborhood and to community residents. And the arts community has been central to what's been happening in, in Boyle Hearts. I often think about art, some artists often go to places that are, uh, you know, warehouses, not very expensive because they can't afford it. But in this case, art galleries became a real flashpoint in Boyle Heights. And there was terms like art washing and white walled war zones. So tell us how the art flashpoint in Boyle Heights. Yeah, I think um, that I want to call out the importance that that art and the cultural rich richness in Bull Heights has been there for a really long time, right? Um, it's also been home to the mural m movement within um, Chicano community. Um, so you walk around the neighborhood and you see walls full of art that reflect um, the history and the community. You'll hear musicians. So. Um, the flashpoint that's happened in most recent times, which around the transformation of a warehouse um, area that is actually sandwiched between public housing and the downtown um, LA and the movement from the investment from downtown into the neighborhood of Bull Heights. So it's a big tension around like the use of that space and the other needs of the community, including you know housing and transportation and other amenities. And that uh, public housing is also very important to, um, to providing homes for people. Rachel Swan, let's get you in here on your reporting covering this tension around housing around transit. Is there a way to do it that doesn't uh, push up prices and push people out? Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot a lot of cities in the Bay Area um, are doing things like impact fees, um, you know, uh, tax increment financing around transit areas. Um, putting a, a fee on developers to create more funding for affordable housing. I mean, so there's definitely responsible ways to build dense around transit. I mean, you know, like when we look at transit in the Bay Area, you know, we have like, take for example, BART stations. I mean, we have a lot of places where there just could be infill. It's just asphalt. Senator Weiner, uh, Palo Alto tripled their housing supply, new housing units. That's still only 300 units in a city of 65,000. 
um, <laughs> you know, more than usual, you know, uh, give us a scope, a scope of the issue. How many, how many jobs are being created? How much housing does, does the Bay Area need? Yeah, and I, uh, credit where credit is due. I, I, I mean, we're seeing some cities like Palo Alto, like Mountain View, uh, uh, wealthier cities that have historically been intensely anti-housing, welcome jobs but no housing, and kids can't afford to move back home. Uh, and there, you're starting to see a shift. But uh, you know, tripling a tiny number, uh, again, it's progress. Um, but w in terms of the scale of what we're facing, uh, just to put it in perspective, st this is statewide in California. It's a statewide problem. It's no longer just a few high cost areas. Uh, our housing deficit in California right now is 3.5 million homes. We are three and a half million homes short of where we need to be. And that number keeps growing. And that's including at all income levels. And we need it at all income levels. Uh, in context, when you look at the other 49 states combined, guess what their housing deficit is? Approximately three and a half million homes. We're equal to the other 49 states. Shows how intense it is here. Uh, we need to make sure that we are doing this at a scale that we need while protecting renters so people aren't getting evicted. And Cheng, how do you see that, you say that housing has kind of shuffled the traditional left and right in, in American politics. Typical divisions don't, don't align because there are some, some, you have progressives who are Sanders supporters who are pro-development, pro-housing, pro mm -hmm. but you expect the left to be kind of against a lot of, you know, and against big money. All of this, when we, when we talk about it, it's, it comes to land, place, people, and in the Bay Area, it's kind of a microcosm of the, the state and the country. There's, there's so much context to work with. There's different types of you know, topographies and access to transportation. And so you know, I think our traditional zoning techniques have been so one size fits all that um, it's no longer relevant anymore. You know, it used to be maybe two or three types of housing, and now um, we really want to open up and, and give people many transportation choices and many housing choices. And I think uh, the beauty of life is that you can have a whole variety. And that you know, when you think of natural systems, resilience comes from diversity and choice and uh, being able to experiment and iterate and adjust. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows recorded with a live audience are available wherever you podcast. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time, everybody.